Good evening, I'm Nima Rajan and this is Forum Daily for Friday, September 16th. Tonight, we begin in the nation's capital, where the government has released details of how Canada plans to commemorate our late Queen on Monday. The National Commemorative Ceremony will be held a few hours after the Queen's state funeral in London. A memorial parade will depart from Ottawa's Cartier Drill Hall at 12.10 p.m. Eastern Time. And it will include two mounted detachments of the RCMP musical ride, a 100-person military guard of honor, and several marching bands. The parade will arrive at Christchurch Cathedral at 1 p.m. for the memorial service. All right, switching gears to the housing market, as the annual rate of housing starts was down in August compared to July. Canada Mortgage and Housing Corp. says the seasonally adjusted annual rate of housing starts in August was just over 267,000 units. Now, this is down 3 percent from the over 275,000 units the previous month. The decrease came as the annual pace of urban starts fell 3 percent last month, this with the rate of multi-unit urban starts down 4 percent. The COVID-19 pandemic was among the hot topics of the first leader's debate of the Quebec election campaign. In Montreal last night, François Legault was forced to defend his CAQ government's handling of the health crisis and the public health measures used to curb it. Conservative Party leader Eric Duhaime, whose party is polling in fourth place, attacked Mr. Legault. This was over his party's move to impose a five-month curfew and other strict health measures. Monsieur Legault shot back that he didn't get into politics to close businesses and impose masks. He said the health measures were simply brought in to reduce contacts and save lives. All right, well, meanwhile, some Canadian experts are warning that it's too early to declare the COVID-19 pandemic over. Their comments come after the head of the World Health Organization said this week that the end of the global health crisis is in sight. Dr. Fahad Razak headed up the recently disbanded group of scientists advising Ontario's government on the novel coronavirus. And Dr. Razak says COVID variants have cropped up during the fall and winter. And this led to a surge in cases and deaths. And that could still happen again this year. All right, well, this comes as Canada's health care system continues to struggle with staff shortages. And the Canadian Medical Association is suggesting the solution may be to further open the gateway for international doctors. The group is calling for a national licensing pathway for doctors, and they're asking for regulatory changes to make the licensing system easier to navigate. Under the current structure, each province has its own licensing system, and Dr. Catherine Smart said in a recent interview that this is confusing and bureaucratically cumbersome. She says a national physician license could provide a single streamlined process for verifying the credentials of internationally trained doctors, which could potentially ease the strain on the Canadian health care system. All right, well, meanwhile, Ontario's chief medical officer of health says monkeypox activity in the province has peaked. Dr. Kieran Moore says with roughly 16 to 18 cases a day being identified through PCR testing, the province has peaked in its total number of active cases as of the week of July 15th. Dr. Moore says reported cases are down to around one a day, and most of those new cases are travel-related, particularly from American hotspots. Now, this is rather than people acquiring an infection within Ontario. Turning to Alberta now, where the government has rescinded Colin May's appointment as the head of the province's Human Rights Commission. It's over a dispute stemming from a passage in a book review that has been criticized as Islamophobic. Justice Minister Tyler Shandro publicly urged Mr. May to resign earlier this week. This was after a Muslim advocacy group said he had failed to keep a promise to meet with them over the comments he had written in 2009. Mr. May refused to resign and instead hired a lawyer who said his client had done nothing wrong. All right, taking a look at wholesale sales now, which fell 0.6% in July to $80.2 billion. Statistics Canada is blaming it on a drop in sales of personal and household goods for that month. Consumers also bought less clothes and shoes, but sales of machinery, equipment and supplies rose 1.6% to $17 billion. Saskatchewan farmers are reaping the benefits of warm, dry weather during the first half of this month, which has helped them make very good harvest progress. Saskatchewan Agriculture's weekly crop report says 64% had been combined as of Monday. 
Now, this is up from 42 percent the previous week. Some frost was reported in scattered areas from the southeast up into the northwest, and damage is not fully assessed as some areas had a harder frost than others. Stay with us. Forum Daily will be right back, and when we return, we're going to take a look at gas prices with Dan McTeague. Stay tuned. Welcome back. It's time to take a look at gas prices and policies. Forum Daily's energy update with Dan McTeague from gaswizard.ca coming up next. Over to you, Dan. Well, thank you very much for that, Nima. And uh, again, a very exciting week on the energy front. Uh, these low prices that everybody has been enjoying, relatively speaking, by the way. I mean, who would ever think that average prices in Canada about a buck fifty uh, would be a bargain? But uh, certainly a lot better than you know when you and I spoke back in uh, early June when the average price in Canada was a lot closer to two fifteen a liter. Uh, but I think these are things that uh, we can't assume will remain forever. Yes, it's true this time of year, gasoline uh, production is uh, is fairly steady, uh, demand is steady. Uh, we shift over from, uh, as of this week, from uh, summer to winter gasoline, and that usually means a couple cents difference to the advantage of consumers, usually three or four cents a liter. Uh, but this is uh, a market that is behaving unlike anything uh, witnessed in the past 30 years since I've been doing this, and it's likely to uh, get more convoluted, and I would say probably a little bit more chaotic as we head towards uh, the month of December. I say December because that's when uh, energy markets really have to decide whether or not uh, the U.S. government can continue to, you know, to supply uh, the world with borrowed uh, strategic petroleum oil, and uh, as a result, try to keep down prices, those uh, that that reserve has to be refilled. It's going to be refilled between eighty and one hundred dollars a barrel. That means that there will be upward pressure, not just in terms of price, but most importantly demand. It's creating a demand. You've got to replenish that by law unless something can change. And I don't think that's going to ver work out very well for the Biden administration. At the same time, it's pretty clear that Europe is in a, is in a, a straitjacket. It has no choice but to burn oil uh, and, that, uh, and diesel in order to uh, make up for the uh, uh, curtailment of natural gas coming from Russia. Of course, Canada refuses to provide natural gas directly, build any any LNG projects. We saw that kind of farce with the prime minister who sat, uh, you know, talking about futuristic uh, mumbo jumbo with hydrogen that won't be around for the 30, 40, 50 years, if at all. Uh, while Germany's needs are natural gas today, our prime minister, of course, said, uh, you know, we can fantasize about uh, some kind of uh, romantic uh, technologies that uh, can't be proven, uh, certainly not without a lot of use of fossil fuels, and that being the case, uh, with, certainly with respect to hydrogen. That aside, I think over the next week, Nima, we're going to be looking at a circumstance where prices are going to start to uh, shed off this volatility of up, you know, 5% one day down, 5% the next day. Uh, sooner or later, we're going to have to come to the realization that the Fed in the United States and, and uh, central banks around the world are going to have to increase interest rates for all the borrowed money, for all the money printing that uh, our government and other governments have been engaged in, and there comes a, that comes at a cost. The reality, however, is that we are looking at a severe shortage of oil, diesel, jet fuel, uh, heating fuel as we head into colder weather, and of course, uh, natural gas and propane. So uh, with all that, gasoline prices inevitably will have to go up. I think that's gonna be a lot closer to the end of October into November than it is now. For now, I think, uh, and for the foreseeable week, let's deal with what we have ahead of ourselves. British Columbia should see about a three cent decrease. Alberta, not much of a change. Uh, same for Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario. Look for prices to drop back to below a dollar fifty, but to go back up towards a dollar fifty-five by week's end. So about a five cent increase. Same for Montreal. So they'll be pushing a little closer to a dollar seventy a liter. With the Maritimes, of course, uh, even with their uh, regulated prices, we'll have to inevitably throw in the towel uh, and uh, drive prices up probably about three to five cents a liter between now and next week. What that really means is that uh, prices for this time of year, especially on the gasoline side, as they are starting to indicate going a little higher, it's diesel that I think is uh, the one we're going to have to focus a lot more on. And that's because uh, it is really a proxy, especially in the eastern parts of Canada. Uh, a lot of uh, homes are heated with uh, with uh, home heating fuel. Uh, it comes from the distillate family. And that, of course, means greater pressure 
on diesel prices, which inevitably lead to higher prices for gasoline as refineries try to shift away from uh, producing uh, things like gasoline. It'll leave it somewhat stranded and it'll leave it in shorter supply. Bottom line is that we're still looking at very strong, robust demand for all fuels. The economies are recovering, perhaps too much. That's one of the reasons the Fed may have to respond by higher interest rates as we're seeing economic growth continue to uh, beat expectations. Uh, we live in an environment in NEMA where good news is, in fact, bad news. So on the energy front, we'll keep you focused, going up a little bit this week. Uh, in the meantime, we'll try to ride this out for the next several days. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks for having me again, NEMA. All right, thanks again for that, Dan. Again, that was Dan McTeague, Senior Petroleum Analyst at GasWizard.ca. He is also the President of Canadians for Affordable Energy. Stay with us. Forum Daily will be right back with a look at the crypto world with Catherine Murray, host of The Buck Stops Here. Stay with us. Welcome back. Up now, we have Forum Daily's weekly crypto and digital asset update with Catherine Murray, the host of The Buck Stops Here. Take it away, Catherine. Thanks, Seema. Hello, everyone, and welcome to your weekly crypto and digital asset update. I am Catherine Murray. Well, we do continue to see volatility within the cryptocurrency space alongside volatility within the North American equity markets. This on the back of hotter than expected inflation from the United States, specifically CPI, core CPI coming in at 6.3%, up from 5.9% the previous month. This is indicating that inflation is, in fact, spreading throughout the economy. In other words, it's not just in the energy and or food costs, but really moving into other areas of the economy, as I said, including services. And of course, this is stoking fears that the U.S. Federal Reserve and or the Bank of Canada will continue to tighten or raise rates, and that is putting downward pressure on risk assets. Now, having said that, as we look at the cryptocurrency market, it still stands at about $1 trillion in terms of asset value. Bitcoin holding around that's 19,700, uh, up by about 2% week over week. But of course, as we know, these markets are 24 seven, so we'll see where uh, we end up over the next couple of hours. Um, the big news, of course, this week, which we indicated last week we expected to happen, was that in Ethereum did in fact finish their long awaited energy saving merge upgrade. Uh, this is probably crypto's most significant software upgrade, uh, reducing energy costs and also paving the way for more individuals uh, to use the platform. Now, of course, despite all of, all of the volatility in the space, there are a number of big firms continuing to move into cryptocurrency and blockchain. In fact, a consortium of financial heavyweights uh, we've got Fidelity, Schwab, and hedge fund manager Citadel, um, all planning to launch a new exchange expected to be called EDX Markets. Um, and again, despite all the headline uncertainty surrounding inflation and, and what comes next, long-term investors do continue to invest in the space. That's what long-term investing is all about. Uh, with, of course, Two Sigma Ventures, which is a venture firm focused on um, early stage investing in the areas of crypto, DeFi, uh, SaaS, or software as a service, and also, of course, fintech. Um, they were actually able to raise two funds, uh, raise $400 million across two funds. So again, investors continuing to put money into the space for the long term. Um, and a really interesting use case here for blockchain, a uh, famous firm, buyout firm that is KKR, is slicing out a piece uh, of one of their funds, one of their private equity funds, putting it on public blockchain to allow investors to access uh, a little bit of their PE funds. And this is really interesting and important because normally to invest in many private equity firms, you have to have a certain amount of dollars um, and you need to be an accredited investor. So to be able to use blockchain to slice out part of their funds is how I understand it. Um, to allow access to more individuals is almost the democratization of private equity. And it's, it's an interesting move and it's interesting that technology and specifically blockchain allows that to happen. Also a big firm here, uh, the consulting giant Accenture um, has added during the pandemic, 150,000 new team members virtually. Um, this is not just through Zoom, but apparently a new Accenture employee during the past couple of years was given a laptop and an XR headset. Um, this says the company envisions 
the metaverse as the continuum of how we actually use the internet and how we will be using and interacting with the internet, i.e. metaverse. Uh, and lastly here, I haven't talked about NFTs over the past number of weeks, just given so much focus on the volatility within cryptocurrencies and, um, and also the impact that the crypto winters had on so many firms and of course a number of bankruptcies. But interestingly here within the NFT space, um, Starbucks is going to be using one of Ethereum's platforms to launch NFT stamps and sell limited edition NFTs. Uh, this is being billed as an extension of their existing Starbucks rewards program. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's going to be perks or tradable uh, loyalty perks that you've received, but I understand that there will be some challenges and even um, some interactive games on the uh, Starbucks app. We'll see how that um, translates and how we can further understand it, Nima. Um, I'm certainly, full disclosure, a Starbucks fan and an owner of the stock, uh, and I have the app. So maybe I'll do a, a use case when it launches, I think, at the end of this year. Nima, I'll leave it there. Back to you. Thanks for that, Catherine. Again, that was Catherine Murray, host of The Buck Stops Here. All right, stay with us. We'll be right back after a break with a look at major news stories and headlines from around the world. Ukrainian authorities have begun the recovery process of hundreds of bodies. This is from a mass burial site in a forest recaptured from Russian forces. President Volodymyr Zelensky says the site is an example of what the Russian occupation has led to in his country. Police say the burial site contained 445 graves and it was discovered close to Izium. This was after a rapid counteroffensive by Ukrainian forces retook the city and much of the Kharkiv region. Meanwhile, Germany is taking control of three Russian-owned refineries. This will be to ensure energy security before a European Union embargo on oil from Russia takes effect next year. German officials say that two subsidiaries of Russian oil giant Rosneft would be put under the administration of a German government agency. And as a result, the agency will also control the company's shares in the refineries in Germany. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz says the move is a far-reaching energy policy decision to protect the country. Turning to the U.S. now, where the Biden administration is moving one step closer to developing a central bank digital currency known as the digital dollar. The White House said today that after President Joe Biden issued an executive order in March calling on agencies to look at ways to regulate digital assets, the agencies came up with nine reports. One Treasury recommendation is the U.S. advance policy and technical work on a potential central bank digital currency. The Atlantic Council nonpartisan think tank says many other countries already are exploring or have created a central bank digital currency. Well, finally, some good news for flood-ravaged Pakistan. Weeks of floodwaters are now receding in the worst-hit southern Sindh province. Now, this comes after a deadly summer in which monsoons have left hundreds of thousands of people homeless. Irrigation officials say the water level in the previous 48 hours receded as much as one meter in some areas. However, authorities have said that the complete draining of water in Sindh will take at least three months. The floods have killed just over 1,500 people, left a half million homeless, and sparked a race against spreading disease. Moving to France now, where many domestic and some international flights have been cancelled. This comes after air traffic controllers went on a national strike today over pay and recruitment issues. France's Civil Aviation Authority warned that domestic traffic would be severely disrupted because many flights have been cancelled and others are experiencing long delays. Travelers have been advised to postpone their trip if possible. Well, the frustration is growing in Lebanon, where desperate people broke into at least four banks today. This was to demand the release of their trapped savings accounts. It's a sign of growing chaos in the small Mediterranean nation that's dealing with a historic economic meltdown. The bank raids are raising the possibility that more desperate depositors might try to extract their money by force. The economic crisis has been exacerbated by the pandemic and by the massive blast at Beirut's port in August 2020 that caused billions of dollars in damage. 
Back in the U.S., Donald Trump is increasingly embracing the QAnon conspiracy theory. Using his Truth Social platform, the former Republican U.S. president reposted an image of himself this week. It was overlaid with the words, the storm is coming. In QAnon lore, the storm refers to Mr. Trump's final victory. This is when his opponents supposedly will be tried and possibly executed. It's among dozens of recent Q-related posts from Mr. Trump. And experts who study the fringe movement say he may be trying to rally his most stalwart supporters as investigations into his conduct escalate. Meantime, the wave of attempted book bans and restrictions in the U.S. continues to intensify, according to the American Library Association. Deborah Caldwell Stone is director of the ALA's Office for Intellectual Freedom. She says there are organizations that are compiling lists of books to ban without necessarily reading or even looking at them. The organization has documented 681 challenges to books through the first eight months of this year, and they involve over 1,600 different titles. A new study coming out of Halifax and the Netherlands says clans of sperm whales from across the Pacific Ocean actually use unique dialects in their clicking communication. The study, published earlier this month, says that when the territory of whale clans overlap, their dialects become a more distinct marker of which group they belong to. Researchers are calling the discovery a type of non-human culture. All right, I'm Nima Rajan, and that'll do it for your look at national and international news for today. Remember, for more news on demand, you could always visit our website, thenewsforum.ca, and be sure to follow us on our social media handles on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. You could also watch all of our commentary programming and interviews on the News Forum YouTube channel. See you next time, Canada. Take care.